Hello again, Stigler here, Alan Dickerson, and we're going to continue with our tutorial series on Great Battles of the American Civil War. In our last uh, episode, we went through an entire turn worth of activations after doing the start of the turn efficiency determination and determination of how many activations that each side gets. So that is a process that is done each turn at the top of the hour and uh, we did some movement but the forces were really not in close proximity to be able to show off fire combat and shock especially so I thought I would move our forces a little bit closer together and start this one with just some examples of uh, fire combat. So let us go to another stage of the Battle of Cross Keys where Trimble delivered a bit of a rabbit punch to the Union left and I've arrayed the forces in such a way that I believe mirror the historical situation then. So we've got Trimble's brigade here on the right facing um, Stahl's brigade here. And what happened historically was that the 8th New York, this unfortunate regiment, um, wandered down into this little depression, came up on the other side, and met a fusillade of Confederate fire and was pretty much decimated. And then the Confederate forces uh, completed a sweep sort of around this side here near the Nishter farm and gave the Union a bit of a bloody nose. So we're going to use that historical example as a guide here for our fire combat. Uh, before we start that, we will just run through a couple of quick examples of fire combat that are used by units during their activation. Uh, the first one I'll start with is simple infantry fire combat. And let us assume now, uh, for the purposes of this part of the demonstration, that uh, the Union are activated. So Blanker's division is activated. And Stahl here is his first brigadier. This brigade is under advance orders and what that means in terms of gameplay is that they have their full movement allowance to use but each individual regiment or artillery battery can either fire or move but not both. So they have to choose one of the combat actions that they wish to perform. Also, if they choose to move, they cannot move adjacent to any enemy infantry or cavalry unit, although they can move adjacent uh, if they want to a enemy artillery unit that is by itself in its hex. So, they have to make that particular choice because they have not committed to the attack. Now, let's assume that the Union actually want to uh, try to replicate that advance by the 8th New York. In order to do that, they're going to have to move down into this little depression here, and that is adjacent to these Confederate units. So they're going to have to change their posture from advance to attack orders. Now, at the beginning of the turn, the beginning of the hour, they chose advance. So because this is the middle of the turn, in order to change their orders, they have to undergo the brigade orders change process. And this is done right after the division is activated. The owning player has to decide for all of the brigades in the division whether they want to try to change their orders 
and whether they want to try to coordinate brigades. They have to make that decision, and then, of course, they have to live with the results. Whether they get the intended results or not is up to fate. So let's assume that we just drew Blanker's division, and the other brigades are not in position to um, help this particular attack, so we're not going to try to coordinate. However, we are going to try to change Stahl's orders. So we consult the orders change table, and we roll one die, and in this case we have a modifier. Blenker, the division commander, is stacked with Stahl. So that means that he gets a plus one to the die roll. So we roll one die, and we get a nine. So that is greater than six, so we get to change orders. So now the entire brigade is under attack orders, which is what we wanted. Uh, other things that could happen are uh, retains, which would have meant that the brigade stayed in advance orders, and they have to live with that. Or you can get retain and stand, which is the worst possible result, where not only does the brigade retain its orders, but it cannot move. It can still fire if allowed by the orders that it must retain, but it cannot move. That's basically where you've got a lot of runners and admin people running around and nobody knows what's kind of going on, and you've got regimental commanders who you know, are being told to do something, and they're saying, I haven't really received orders to do that, and so they just basically stand around and do nothing for the time period that is simulated by the activation. The other thing that can happen is uh, if you roll a modified 4, you get what is known as the loose cannon result, and what loose cannon means is that if your brigadier has a rating other than what Stahl has here, which is an N for normal. Say, for instance, we're talking about Trimble here. He has an A for aggressive uh, profile. Uh, other commanders can have a U for unreliable, which means I could go either way. And some may have a C for cautious profile. If a loose cannon is the result of a attempt to change orders, then an aggressive brigadier will change to attack orders and send every member of his brigade forward toward the nearest enemy and attempt to shock. A uh, cautious or timid brigadier will go in the other direction and his units will uh, use whatever means they can to withdraw at least one hex away. And then he places the brigade under advance orders. If the brigadier is unreliable, then you have a further die roll, which can result as the brigadier assuming the profile of either an aggressive, a normal, or a cautious brigadier. And then they have to do what that commander would do if he rolled a loose cannon result. So if, if you are normal and you get a loose cannon result, it is the same as a retain. So loose cannon only affects cautious and aggressive profiled brigadiers. So getting back to our situation here, we have had a successful change of orders for Stahl. Now he's under attack orders. So, we've decided that we want the 8th New York to move forward and try to storm the Confederate position, which 
doesn't really look like a smart move, but nevertheless, that's what they're going to try to do. Let's, let's assume the 8th New York is going to make its fateful march into history here. And it's going to use its attack orders to uh, move into position to try and take the rebel position. Now, under attack orders, there are some changes to how these units can operate. The first big change is they can both move and fire during their operations. They can also move adjacent to any enemy unit, and they can initiate a shock attack after they move adjacent. Their movement allowance, however, is halved from 6 to 3. They will be able to move here and then fire at actually they could fire at both of these uh, units ahead of them and I think that's what they're going to try and do they're going to try and soften up these two enemy units in so doing they're going to draw return fire from both of those units as well and also to illustrate another point what we're going to do is say that the 8th New York is only going to fire at 21st North Carolina. And the reason I'm going to do it that way is to illustrate the fact that when designating return fire, the returning fire forces can return fire with a unit that is not the target of the attacking player's fire. So, even though the 8th of New York is firing at 21st North Carolina, it is also adjacent to the 15th Alabama, which can, if it wants to, also fire back at 8th New York, because it is also in the frontal hexes of the attacking unit and is adjacent to the target of fire. This rule was put in there to stop players from kind of cherry picking and finding say the weakest unit in a line, moving a unit up to it and only firing at that unit and only re drawing return fire from that unit in the hopes that it can find the weakest unit to pick on. So in the case of a long line of opposing units it may work out that each unit in a defending line is going to be adjacent to an attacking enemy unit and they may want to return fire at, at that unit. However, in the case where you only have one unit that's moving forward, you can't cherry pick one unit and expect the neighboring unit to simply stand there and, and watch. Okay, also once a attack is declared by an attacking unit, the defending unit before resolving that fire has to state which, if any, of its defending units are going to then return fire. This is also there so that you don't uh, have players kind of waiting to see what the effect of the fire is before they determine if, well, Maybe if their fire is ineffective, I'll wait for another unit to move in and then fire at it. Things like that, which are pretty gamey. So, that's the uh, rule now. After an attacker declares fire, the defenders, if any, who are going to return fire, must also declare. So, the 8th of New York moves here, declares it's going to fire at 21st North Carolina. The 15th Alabama here is going to also return fire. So both of them are going to return fire. And in so doing, perhaps we will recreate that, uh, that same unfortunate event that happened historically. The 8th New York, we start with the 8th New York. It has a strength of 11. However, only 
seven strength points can ever fire out of the same hex. So if it wants to split its fire, it would have to go four, four into one hex, three into another hex, or maybe five into one hex, two into another hex, or so forth, partition the seven strength points however they see fit. However, let's just say for the sake of argument, we're going to fire all seven at the 21st North Carolina. So we consult first our range effects and we see what happens with the firing unit and we check its weapon type which is a uh, in the black circle here it's a R for rifle. We check the range effects chart and find out what the modifier is at range 1 for a rifle and it is plus 1. So that's a plus 1 modifier to the die roll just for the weapons. Then we check the defender and we see that he is in wooded terrain and we add that modifier. So any of the many modifiers listed under the fire table can be added. In this case the only adjustment is to consult the terrain effects chart which tells us that woods create a negative one effect for fire. So that cancels out the plus one for the rifled muskets. So we have a modifier of zero. So now we move to the fire table. This is small arms fire, infantry, and we have seven strength points. So we find the six to eight column and we roll a die to get the result. We get a three. The result for a three is a lowercase d. Lowercase d means that the defending unit must roll against its cohesion and it is not modified um, by the result itself. So the 21st North Carolina has a cohesion of 7 and we roll and we get a 2. 2 is much lower than the 7 cohesion so the result is no effect. If we had rolled an 8 or a 9 then the unit would have been disordered. That's the fire for the 8th New York. Now we have return fire coming from both of these units. So we'll start with the 21st North Carolina. They are armed with muskets. And at range 1, muskets get a plus 2. They also can only fire 7 strength points of their 8 out of the hex. And the defending, now defending 8th New York is in a clear hex so they don't get the benefit of the woods. So we also have a let's make sure that down a minor slope does, has no effect for small arms. Okay. So the slope there doesn't affect the, the combat either. So we consult the same six to eight table and this time we have a plus two for the Confederate unit. He rolls a 6, plus 2 is an 8, and the result here is a 1, lowercase d, plus 2. What that means is that the 8th New York suffers one casualty, and it must roll for disorder, adding 2 to that die roll. So, first thing we'll do is to find a strength point marker, move that there, and increase it. Okay, so he's down to 10, and now he has to disorder, die roll, and add 2. That's a 9, way over his cohesion rating of 5. So now the unit is also disordered. I will 
rotate this, put it underneath. So that didn't look real good. And now we will chime in similarly with the 15th Alabama, which is also musket armed. And they will fire as well. Seven strength points with muskets, plus two. He rolled a zero, and that is modified to a two. On the six to eight table is a D minus one. So now this unit has to roll for disorder, only will take one away from the die roll. He rolled a six, minus one is five, still greater than its this unit's cohesion, which is now four because it's disordered. So this causes a second disorder. And we consult the second disorder chart, and that tells us that for a disordered infantry unit that suffers its second disorder as the result of fire combat, the result is that it loses one strength point and must retreat one or two hexes at the owning player's discretion. So let us now decrease the strength to nine and retreat, let's say, one hex because let's assume that uh, Stahl still wants to press this attack eventually. So they would move backwards. Now note that because they move backwards, there is no chance for the Confederates to get any kind of withdrawal fire because a retreat is not movement per se. Movement is assumed to be voluntary movement, whereas a retreat is forced movement. There is an example there of fire combat. Let's move forward and let's assume that Staho is really, really feeling his oats and he wants to put in this attack in the worst way. So let's assume that he's going to now try with the 45th New York to do the same thing. This is even more foolhardy because we can see that we have this, um, it's not steep, it's a minor slope here, both going down from this higher terrain and then also if we hide the units, well, no, there's no slope down there. So they're going to move down this slope and across the stream and try to press home and attack. That's going to be uh, pretty interesting. But, well, let's assume that uh, the 45th New York does have some uh, tactical regimen. And what they're going to try and do is come around to the flank here and press an attack. Now, we do have this gully here in the way. That adds one to the movement. But we know that units in attack order have a movement allowance of three. So let's assume that he'll move one, change his facing, two for the gully, and three. He'll move into positions, expend all of his movement, and then fire into the flank of the 21st North Carolina, which can do nothing. They can't return fire because they've already fired at the 8th of New York. If they had not had a chance to fire, they might risk a UDD to pivot while they are in the frontal fire zone of an ostensibly attacking unit to face it and return fire, but they're not even going to do that because they know that they can't return fire having already done so. So, the 45th New York is going to get an attack here, and we're going to have an additional modifier for flanking fire. So let's resolve that. Here we see that the 45th New York is equipped with ER or European rifle. We 
consult the range effects chart and find that at range 1 the effect is plus 1. We know that for flanking fire we get a plus 1. and for the woods we get a negative one. So the overall effect is plus one. Seven strength points maximum can fire out of any one hex, so we're on the six to eight table, and we have a plus one total, and we roll a nine, which turns into a ten. The result there is a one and then a uppercase D. What that means is the 21st North Carolina suffers a strength point loss and will reduce them to 7. And also, they are automatically disordered. We don't even roll for it. Lowercase d, you roll for it. Uppercase d is automatic. And those are the effects of that fire. All right. Now let us uh, continue that assault. And we will move the 41st New York into position and have him, uh, well, let's see. If he were to move to this hex, he would not be able to fire because this terrain here would block fire into this hex. So that's not going to work out for him. But he could join the assault and we'll have him go one, two, changes facing, three. Oh, that'll work out. And he will withhold his fire because he doesn't want the 21st North Carolina to retreat away and spoil the upcoming shock attack. We'll move this guy up in support. Two for the woods. Three here. Let's say these other two units are going to similarly uh, attempt to hit the other side of the Confederate line. So we'll move this unit in first. And here we have, if we hide the units, uh, that's a minor slope in a gully there. So that'll be one for the gully, one for the stream. That's two, three and he will not fire. This unit will make a similar move, only he will fire, and then the 21st Georgia will announce that it will return fire. So again, we have for the 39th New York rifle armament, so plus one for that, negative one for the woods, and those are the only modifiers. So we'll be on the six to eight column of the small arms table with a total of plus one for the modifier. We get a two, that translates to a three, lowercase d, roll for the Confederates, four, lower than their seven, no effect, return fire going to be seven strength points of muskets. Range effects chart, that's a plus two. No terrain. So we're on the six to eight table because only seven strength points can fire out of any one hex. Six to eight column, plus two on the die roll. We roll again, seven plus two, nine. The result, one and automatic disorder. So we will put a nine strength point marker under him and automatic disorder, so we'll flip him over. There. 
Okay, so we've already ascertained that the artillery unit doesn't really have a shot um, due to the canopy of the trees in front of it. He's going to have to maneuver for another position. So let's move him to do just that. So we'll move him down here and we'll change his facing so that maybe he'll have better luck firing this way if the attack goes poorly. The final thing we're going to do for this brigade is to move Stahel into a hex with one of the units that will be shocking. The reason for this is that if a brigade attempts to shock and the brigadier is not present in any of the shocks, not stacked with an attacking unit, then all of the shock attacks for that entire brigade will suffer a penalty as a result because the attacking men know that their brigadier is kind of hanging back, he's not joining the assault, egging them on, so they're a little less fired up for that. So to preclude that, Staho will move into this hex and now we will move to the shock phase. All right, now one thing I will say about the shock phase is that it is every bit as confusing as what it is attempting to simulate. It has six sub-phases within one phase, and they are done in different ways, so it really behooves you to keep your player aid card in hand and on the back page, the shock resolution procedure is shown there. And religiously follow it step by step by step. Uh, if you attempt to just wing it and remember it, you're probably going to make mistakes that you're going to have to end up correcting. So don't feel bad that you may never remember exactly everything that happens in the right order. But keep that uh, shock resolution procedure uh, chart in front of you. Okay. One of the important things to remember is that most of the subphases in the shock are performed in the order that the defender wishes as far as having to make UDDs or or for fire. But when it comes down to actually performing the, the last step, which is the shock combat itself, the shock combats are resolved in either right to left or left to right in a line so that the attacker doesn't get to try and pick and choose the order in which the shock happens because that can also affect which units have to retreat, which units might route, all those sort of things that can happen. The, the chaos of shock is such that no attacker is going to be able to coordinate with precision anything that happens. And that is why the attacker will simply designate a side of the line of shock attacks for the brigade and simply move to the other side in order. But for the previous five subfaces, the defender can choose uh, the order in which they make any uh, checks. So the first subphase is that the attacker designates all targets of shock and, uh, and also of cavalry charges that may have been set up during movement. So what that means is, in this case, it's pretty easy because we don't have a straight line of units where 
some units might have a choice of units to attack. It's all very clear. We have these two units attacking this one unit and these two units attacking this one unit. The thing to remember when designating attacks is that you can't have any units that are left undesignated for attack. So if, say, say, for instance, this unit were here, the two Union units couldn't say, we're going to pick on the 21st Georgia and leave the 16th Mississippi alone. You can't do that unless that unit were simply adjacent to a Union unit. If it is in their fire cone and also in the attacking fire cone, then you simply can't ignore it. He has to be designated as a target of shock by somebody. So that kind of limits your ability to cherry pick an attack. So that is why there is a subface for designating where it is not obvious who the attackers and who the defenders are for any particular shock. So let us get place shock markers and a reminder to check cohesion on the target units. All right, then we go to subphase two, where the defender can perform retreat before shock. So the defender, if they want, they can simply seed the hex. However, Um, okay, let me, let me explain why a defender might seed a hex without fighting for it. All right, as you can see in these shock attacks, we have one defender who is already disordered and another defender who is not disordered. If a defending unit elects to retreat before shock, and the unit is like the 21st Georgia in good order, they can simply do that. As long as they have a hex to retreat to, they can simply pull back. Whoops, one hex or two, is it? No, it is only one hex for infantry and dismounted cavalry. Cavalry could retreat too. They have to maintain facing, so it's a backwards straight movement like that. And the other thing is, if the brigade that the defender is in is under attack orders, they don't have that option to retreat before shock because they're thinking, move forward anyway. So they will not retreat. Trimble is in advance orders, as evidenced by not having in a, a uh, orders shit there. But let's, for the sake of argument, Move that there, and there. All right. For this unit, the 21st North Carolina, they would be more likely to retreat before shock. And the reason for that is any units that don't retreat before shock will have to uh, undergo a UDD against their cohesion. One of the modifiers, however, is that if the defender is disordered, you add two to the die roll. So that would mean that on a roll greater than a four for the 21st North Carolina, they would suffer a second disorder. And this is even before the shock attack goes in. So for disordered units, if they elect to retreat before shock, they still have to undergo a UDD, but they don't add plus two to it, so they have a better chance of avoiding second disorder if they retreat than if they stand and try to pass a UDD with a plus two. So that's kind of a 
catch-22 at times for certain units, but it is a decision that the defender must make. So in the 21st case, he's going to elect to retreat. So they will move backwards. This unit is going to stand pat. Then, mark the attacking units with May advance markers to show that they can, in the last stage of the shock, move into that vacated hex. Another thing to remember is that a retreating unit can retreat into a hex containing a friendly unit if there happens to be one there, but they cannot retreat into any hex that is also designated for shock during that phase. All right. So now that we have retreated this unit, he has to immediately roll for a UDD for being a disordered unit that is retreated. His benefit is that there is no plus two added to the die roll. It's a straight die roll. He rolls a four, so he's in good shape. So that's the second sub phase. The third is green attacker commitment check. If any of the attacking units are green, and in this case none of them bear the G designation there next to their cohesion, they have to make a UDD just to determine whether or not they can scrounge up the courage to even move in and attack. That doesn't uh, apply here, so we move to the next. Now, all defenders who did not retreat before combat have to make a pre-shock cohesion check. And so the 21st of Georgia would have to make that check. Um, if the unit is disordered, they undergo a plus one. Oh, not a plus two. That's a, a small change recently in the system. It's a plus one. Um, there are positional modifiers, such as if you're being attacked from the flank or the rear, that adds plus one. Uh, if there's a cavalry charge involved, uh, they, the defender suffers a plus one. If the defender is behind breastworks, there's a negative one. And also, if there is a brigadier in the hex, you get uh, a plus or a, a negative one for each star of leaders in the hex. Obviously, there are no uh, leaders in the hex. So, there is no terrain modifiers for pre-shock DRMs. So, he rolls against a 7 cohesion, rolls a 4, so he stands. Okay. Now, we have pre-shock reaction fire. And this is where any defender who has not retreated or has not been forced to retreat away can fire at the onrushing attackers. So the 21st Georgia is going to um, try to repel this larger unit because it's already disordered and it's got a pretty low cohesion. The other unit is only 150 men. They think they can stand that, so they're going to, instead of splitting their fire maybe to try to spoil the entire attack, they're going to go and try to drive off the larger unit. So, we go back to the fire routine, which should be pretty familiar to you now. They are musket armed, plus two for that. 
Uh, Defender is not in any terrain which affords any benefit. Seven total strength points can fire out of a hex, so we're using the six to eight column on the small arms and adding two. We have rolled a four, plus two is a six. That result is a lowercase d plus two. So this unit has to or fails miserably. So that's a second disorder for, for them as a result of fire. So they lose one, eight, and they have to retreat one or two hexes. And they'll retreat that way. And that takes them effectively out of the shock. So now we have a real interesting situation here where we finished with the pre-shock reaction fire and now any shocks that have yet to be resolved and by that I mean we still have adjacent units that have been declared for shock now we actually resolve the shocks that remain this one has already been resolved by the defender retreat before shock. They're only awaiting the advance at the end. Now we have the very unlikely attack of three strength points against ten, but they committed to it and they didn't know that the 39th New York were going to turn tail and run, so in they come and we go to the shock resolution table. So now we have a mix of pro-attacker and pro-defender uh, adjustments and the first of which is the odds ratio. We have three attacking ten. That is worse than one to three. That is one to four odds. And we see here on the odds ratio benefit that that carries with it a negative four die roll adjustment. We see that the defender is in woods that carries an, an additional negative one so now we're down to negative five. We don't have any other positive effects. Neither side is disordered that usually carries a uh, a one modifier in one side or the other's favor. And basically all these effects are cumulative. So now we have the rather daunting negative five that is going to be applied to the attacking roll. And we rolled oh, an eight. Minus five is a three. On the shock table we have a standoff. Both sides are disordered. So they actually got a bit of a let off. Both sides are disordered. Now, after we've resolved all the shocks from left to right, even though there's only one, we now conduct all advances. For this one, it's a standoff. There are no uh, advances. Here, one of these units can advance. Both can't because that would result in having 20 strength points jammed into one hex. We can't have that. So what we'll do is we'll move this one forward. Get rid of the advances. And now the final phase is that we apply post-shock automatic disorder. This normally uh, only affects attacking units and in the case of an attacking unit which has gone through the shock phase without being disordered they do become disordered as a result of post-shock disorder. If, as in the case of the 13th Pennsylvania, they are disordered either before or during the shock resolution, they lose a strength point. 
to just stragglers and people who wander off during the combat. So we'll give him a strength point marker of two and move under. For the defender, this usually has no effect unless they are, say, in march column, in which case they would shake out into advance orders. They would undergo a uh, mandatory change. If uh, cavalry are involved in the shock, the horses will be blown, and they may suffer other effects like that. This was a pretty simple shock phase. Other things can happen such as continued shock where in the event you have a overwhelming kind of attack and a high die roll for the resolution, one of the, one of the results may be that the attacker can or in some cases must continue the uh, assault. In which case what would happen is, after all of the initial shocks are resolved, then the advances are all resolved, then you move to uh, shock continuation. And then this would all happen before you applied the post-shock automatic disorder to uh, attacking and sometimes defending units. So, you've kind of seen what the shock phase looks like, and you now understand how all of a brigade's operations in combat, whether that be fire, movement, shock, are all contained in one activation. There is no everyone move, everyone attack uh, with fire, everyone shock. It doesn't work that way. In Great Battles in the American Civil War, a brigade activation and a divisional activation, if you get brigade coordination, are all a subcontained turn within a turn that happens each time you draw a specific division out of the hat and activate it. So I hope uh, that these two tutorials have scratched the surface and kind of given you enough examples to feel confident moving into uh, a game. And uh, the best thing to do is get some cardboard out on the maps, move them around, uh, roll the dice, have some fun with it, and as you get enough reps and move through several activations and several turns full of activations, this will start to become second nature to you, and it will move uh, quicker each time. And then when you get into the really large battles like Gettysburg or Chickamauga or something like that, then you'll be able to move across a map and go through very, very long turns relatively quickly because you will find that there will always be some divisions which are, say, just moving moving to contact, so they'll only move in the phase when the march chit is pulled out. And then other divisions will be resting and in reserve behind the lines, so they're not going to do a lot when their chit is pulled, and you'll find that most of the action will happen for those divisions that are really locked into combat. Oh, before we go um, fatigue, uh, I do want to touch on that. Fatigue is a optional rule, but many people feel that it shouldn't be optional, and I'm one of them. I think everyone should use that to temper the cardboard general's tendency to uh, treat the men just like cardboard in, in that you know, they don't really see the blood and guts and death. So, you know, it's really easy to 
push a cardboard counter forward and drive them uh, to and beyond what you could normally expect of men without there being some effects. Uh, the basic rules for fatigue are that during a turn, if a unit uses more than two activations per turn, the fatigue for that brigade will go up by one. If a unit, an individual regiment, is the target or the participant in more than one shock phase per turn, they get plus one added to their fatigue for that second and third and fourth shock that they are subjected to or attempt to participate in. And these are all kept track of normally at a brigade level and as you can see, if you start adding fatigue, a brigadier or a brigade has a couple of free levels. The first time you invoke brigade, the status becomes okay. There are no effects of it. Then the next time, there's a zero effect. So in effect, you get two free levels of fatigue. Then after that, you move into the detrimental levels of fatigue. What fatigue levels mean is that you take that number, in this case one, and you subtract it from every fire die roll. You add it to any UDDs that the regiments in that brigade have to undergo. It's a negative in shock if you are totaling up your modifiers for shock. Over and above the uh, checks against cohesion, there will be a negative one against your shock attack or a plus one in favor of the attacker if you are the defender in the shock. And as you can see, if you get to plus two and worse, these uh, plus two and minus two things will really start to tell on a unit. Um, and these effects stay with you until you can move the unit back, put it in reserve, and then you can fix a lot of fatigue all at once. Or if you have a brigade which can go through an entire turn without any of its units doing anything more strenuous than attempting to rally, they can reduce one level. An additional uh, wrinkle in this is that in some battles where the battle was fought a very, very hot day. There are periods during the middle of the day through the afternoon and into the early evening where, because it's so hot, you cannot reduce fatigue. It's just too hot and the sunlight is too direct and you just have to wait until the end of the day when things cool off before you can start to recover fatigue. So the fatigue rules really make a player choose wisely when when to put in an attack. You know, you can't have an attack every turn, even though the enemy might be right in front of you and there's no terrain in the way. You can't just keep assaulting a determined enemy and you know, if you fail to drive him out with fire, you can't just keep attacking him and thinking that you're going to get the same results or the same effectiveness of attack each time you go in. It's going to deteriorate and relatively quickly. So uh, fatigue is another part of the game that is very important. 
another thing that I kind of left out and will go into is that during a brigade's activation, when it's moving, firing, setting up for shocks, an additional thing that you can do is attempt to rally during your activation. And what that means is if you have a unit that is already disordered, hasn't done anything yet during this activation, they can attempt to recover from disorder by simply making a die roll or a UDD against whatever their current um, cohesion is. If they roll that number or lower, then they recover from disorder. If they roll higher than the number, but less than twice what their disorder is, just nothing happens, they remain disordered. If the roll is twice or more what their current cohesion level is, and in this case, if the 8th New York were to attempt to rally and roll an 8 or a 9, then in addition to not recovering from the disorder, they would also uh, lose a strength point due to stragglers deciding, well, this is enough, I'm heading for the rear. Brigadiers can attempt to assist in rally attempts by simply being in the same hex as the unit that's attempting to rally. And they will subtract from the from the die roll, uh, one for every star. So a brigadier will reduce it by one. A division commander will reduce it by two. However, one thing to remember is that a brigadier or a divisional leader or even a corps leader can only affect rally results at the end of their movement for that activation. So they can either attempt to rally units in a hex that they started in and then they cannot move, or they can move to that hex, assist in the rally, and then they're done for the turn. So what that means is, in Stahl's case, if he wanted to uh, help the 8th New York rally, he would not have been able to move over and participate in the shock. And also, because he did not participate in the shock, any of the other attacks, shock attacks during that activation would suffer a negative one for not having a brigadier present to lead the attack. So again, there are some decisions, hard decisions you may have to make with regards to rally. Okay, now I think I've covered most of the usual things that happen during a turn. So I invite you to get your game out, set some counters up, or grab a vassal module, such as I'm doing, move some units around, roll some dice, and have some fun, and uh, really get your feet wet with the system and I'm sure you'll find, as I have, that uh, this is a really fun system to explore the Civil War with. So, have at.